I grew up, as I suspect many of you did, with Discovery Wings. There were a couple of years, somewhere around the first and second grade, that I'd watch Dragon Tales before school and, say, Clash of Wings after. Or it could have been something on history or something on science. And I never will forgive Discovery Network for corrupting the purity that was Discovery Wings into Military Channel, but hey, at least we got the good, solid tank guy out of it. So that's something. Anyway, given that personal history, naturally I ran into this late war German fever dream more than a few times. I'm sure I wasn't the only one. But for those of you who have never seen such a thing before, Wolf called it, forgive my pronunciation, a Triebflugel, or Thrust Wing Hunter. It was meant to be a last-ditch interceptor that could operate without the airfields we were bombing into oblivion at the time, but, perhaps unsurprisingly, they didn't get very far. I'd always judged it to be a bit less plausible than the R-Wing from my beloved Star Fox 64, but there's something about this horrifying chimera of bad ideas and broken rules of thumb that's difficult to look away from. Come on, it looks like it's out of a middle school stick figure fight sketchbook. There's some part of me that had to know if, just maybe, it might have kind of slightly worked. According to Flyout, sorta. In the few weeks I've been screwing around with this sort of configuration, I've begun developing a series of fictional aircraft in addition to the replica of this, let's be honest, more or less fictional design. In interest of that, let's start with just a little bit of alternate history. I don't have the patience for prop punk, so consider this a diet version. Suppose these things somehow got built just barely before Germany falls to the Allies. How and why would that happen? Who cares? What effect does it have on the war? None. The important part is that a couple of prototypes get swept up in Operation Paperclip, and the United States, with the help of Convair, builds a few of her own. Why Convair? Because they were working on rockets at the time, and this kind of bullshit seems their speed. Anyway, a few are captured and or built, and this is one of them. Livery here, based on a few captured Focke-Wulf 190s. We'll come back to alternate history Convair in a bit, but let's set the lazy fiction aside for a moment and talk about how I got this thing to work at all. Believe me when I say these things make ornithopters look like a walk in the park. The most interesting thing about the design process to me was how much I learned about how anyone thought the damn things would have worked. Naturally, Discovery Network was very vague about them. Jets spin the big rotor and make the funny helicopter go. In their defense, I don't think there was much more to go on than that. But if you know anything about airplanes or physics or anything, really, you can probably give me a laundry list of reasons that this thing is total nonsense. Sure, the rotor is driven from the tip, so there's no torque other than bearing friction, but what about gyroscopic precession or P-factor? How, pray tell, was somebody supposed to control one in vertical flight without a cyclic? Why wouldn't it just tip over? It was that last simple one that always got me to file it somewhere between the R-Wing and the Millennium Falcon in the realism spectrum. And I figured it would be the death of the project in Flyout, too. I just wanted to see what would happen. But, as it turns out, it's not quite that simple. In actuality, the first problem I ran into wasn't on landing, but on takeoff. The initial vertical ascent would go okay, but as soon as I began the transition phase, the aircraft would slew wildly in a perpendicular direction, stall into a, heh, <laughs> spin, and generally flail into the ground. That, in of itself, wasn't surprising. That's gyroscopic precession back to bite me, I thought. It was a little worse than I was expecting, but that makes sense, right? In case you aren't familiar, let me go over gyroscopic precession real quick. The short version is this. When you try to rotate a spinning mass, the rotation force will be felt by that mass 90 degrees perpendicular to the angle it was applied. Try to pitch forward, you'll find yourself yawing left. This is one of the causes of left turning tendencies in propeller driven aircraft and was demonstrated to me at flight school with a free spinning bike wheel. Spin the wheel up, hold it in front of you, try to tilt it up, it'll drag you to the side. Cool. I try to rotate the rotor disc forward and it processes to the side. Checks out. There's just one problem. I tried lightening the rotor disc, which should have reduced the gyroscopic forces, but the problem didn't get better, it got worse. Next, I tried to make the rotor disc heavier just for giggles. Guess what? It got better. What the hell sense does that make? Surely a heavier rotor disc should perform worse than a lighter one. In any case, I spend the next few hours beating my head against what I'm sure is some sort of gyroscope problem and getting utterly nowhere. Then, finally, through pure luck, I get it to successfully transition, and I fly it in horizontal flight for the first time. This is a critical moment for several reasons. First, I discover it sounds really cool. Second, I discover it's really fun to fly. Now I'm married to the project and considerably more bullheaded about getting it to work. Third, though, and most developmentally important, 
I managed to pull off the transition from horizontal flight back into vertical flight, again through pure luck, and what I find leaves me at a bit of a loss. The aircraft is inherently stable in vertical flight as long as it's descending. Inherently stable in descent? This must be how Focke thought they were going to get away without having a cyclic. Where was this crucial detail, History Channel? And, come to think of it, why on earth was it happening at all? Of course, it was, and is possible, that this behavior is an unrealistic prediction on Flyout's part, but I'm inclined to think that isn't true. For one, it takes the design concept from being complete fantasy to merely very, very cursed. There was a lot of aerospace fantasy going around in Germany at the time, though, so that's not saying much. But for another, I finally hit F3, and suddenly the behavior I was seeing started to make a bit more sense. What if it wasn't procession I was dealing with, but P-factor? That would explain why lightening the rotor disc had made the problem worse and not better. And, just maybe, the thing causing me all my stability problems on takeoff might be the very same thing that allows the aircraft to become inherently stable on descent. At the time, I'm not sure about that last part yet. But a few more flights with F3 active reveal that it's definitely P-Factor causing all my suffering. And that change in tack is enough for me to get the replica flying. Okay, time for a few more physics principles. First, why don't I expect the aircraft to be stable in descent? Shouldn't it hang from the rotor as long as the center of mass is behind it? Well, the way I see it, it's a pendulum rocket fallacy. The force the rotor delivers should always be along the rotor's axis, just like a rocket. So I shouldn't have a pendulum here. Right? The closer I look, the more I start to second-guess that idea. After all, the aircraft is only stable while descending backwards. Sure, the thrust vector would be along the rotor axis, but a drag vector would be negative the direction of travel. Maybe I don't have a rotor, but some kind of terrifying parachute. Second, the star of the show, P-factor. P-factor is one of the other left-turning tendencies. You can kind of think of it like the aerodynamic version of gyroscopic precession. A force applied to the propeller is felt 90 degrees off. The cause of this behavior is very different, though. In this case, when the propeller is accelerated horizontally through the air, the blade rotating towards the direction of motion travels faster than the blade rotating away, and also experiences a steeper angle of attack. As such, it produces significantly more thrust than the retreating blade, and offsets the center of thrust away from the center of the propeller and toward itself. This presents a serious problem for helicopters, and is one of the bigger reasons helicopter rotors typically are articulated in some way. Unfortunately, or fortunately as the case may be, we don't have that luxury. No blade flap for us, no cyclic for us. So, why do I think the stability and descent behavior might be a feature of P-factor and not the parachute effect I described earlier? For one, the aircraft is most stable at relatively slow descent speeds. It becomes unstable again if the descent speed becomes sufficiently high. That shouldn't happen in a parachute situation. Second, I am able to apply thrust with the rotor to decelerate my descent for a soft landing. That thrust should be along the rotor axis and should not be exempt from the rocket pendulum fallacy. So how am I staying stable, and what do I think might be happening instead? The theory is that... okay, bear with me, there's two theories. We'll call them simple theory and complex theory. At the time of writing, I'm not totally sure which or what mix of both represents the truth. I'm pretty sure complex theory is the most accurate, but we'll start with a simple one. Simple. As the aircraft tries to rotate in vertical flight, one side of the rotor disc begins to descend faster than the other. Therefore, its effective angle of attack and thrust on that side increases, returning the craft to level flight. Doesn't P-Factor say that the force should be offset by 90 degrees and thus totally useless? Well, yeah. I think in this case what I'm dealing with isn't exactly P-Factor, since I'm not relying on the rotor side-loading through the air. I'm not sure what to call it. But now, the complex theory. As the aircraft tries to rotate in flight, it does so around its center of mass. The rotor is offset from the center of mass, so rotating the aircraft around the center of mass side-loads the rotor, by a speed given by the rotor's distance from the center of mass and the speed of rotation. The further the rotor is from the center of mass, the higher the side load. The resulting force is true P-factor, as originally described, but serves to return the aircraft to level flight in much the same way. Why doesn't it felt 90 degrees off? I'm not sure. It seems like at lower rotor RPMs it is. The minimum rotor RPM is re for stability is relatively high. 
So why do I think complex theory is accurate? Three reasons. One, a lot of the flyby wire I'm using to deal with yaw tendencies on the replica Triebflügel are based on translation airspeed, which roughly equates to a measure of how side-loaded the rotor is. I was able to use those figures to almost perfectly cancel yaw tendency based on translation speed, which suggests that the phenomenon does in fact come almost entirely from side-loading. Two, the distance of the center of mass from the rotor is crucially important to stable flight. In simple theory, it shouldn't really matter much. And three, true p-factor, basically what I'm describing in complex theory, is very obvious in horizontal flight. It's safe to assume that it plays a major role in vertical flight as well, though it's harder to dis differentiate it from other forces. And, after all that, what of the original parachute theory? Well, I'm about to dispel that one once and for all, and it's all thanks to the flyout bi-weekly challenge. It so happens that the new challenge, which was to build a regional airliner with a 17-passenger capacity and a 2200km range, came out while I was in the middle of putting the finishing touches on my original Triebflugel replica. That gave me a horrible idea. You know what would be really stupid? Funny helicopter plane, but a regional airliner. So naturally I got to work. And that means it's back to alternate history conveyor. Okay, it's 1960-something, and rapid air travel is becoming available to the middle class for the first time. People are going on vacation to places like Florida and Hawaii, and all sorts of exotic locations previously only accessible by aircraft like the very expensive, very slow Boeing 314 Clipper. And let's say, just to justify this stupid thing, that not all these tourist hotspots have terrific runway infrastructure yet. Enter the extremely fictitious... Convair CV-8675. And let's also say that this is a parallel timeline where the flying public wouldn't mind boarding an unmitigated death trap like this. Anyway, Convair, flush with lots of P-Factor-related experience from their Operation Paperclip involvement with the Triebflugel configuration, decides it would be funny if they made an airliner like that. And, you know, maybe it could be useful for carrying people to unimproved airfields or something. At least that's what they tell the investors. Mostly it's just funny. One of the things they learned about the original design was that it was almost impossible to fly. In fact, they were only able to get it to fly by cramming it full of early fly-by-wire technology that they pretty much had to purpose invent for it. This would be the side-loading compensation I was talking about, and even then it barely worked. You know what would be easier? Just slap a second rotor on that baby and spin it the other way. Sure there's no torque to counter, but just like that, P-Factor is gone. Yay! It's a dream to fly, just like a regular airplane... Wait, we were using the P-Factor, weren't we? Yep, there it is. If parachute theory had been correct, we wouldn't need P-Factor to be stable. But it sure looks like we do need it. I tried pushing the center of mass further behind the rotor center of pressure. The leeway to do this is higher than you might expect, because the center of pressure moves a great distance as the rotor blades feather for forward flight, but even so, I ran out of stability in horizontal flight long before I gained it in vertical. In any case, it didn't make sense because of the aforementioned pendulum rocket problem. What do we, or wacky alternate history convair, do now? We can't drop this thing down to a single rotor. It'll be even more of a nightmare to handle than the original treat flute design. Even if one could get it to work, pilots and passengers would hate it. This dual rotor design is so nice to fly in every phase except landing. How about a cyclic? Well, I would if I could. No scripting and fly out yet. For the purposes of our alternate history, we'll call it an engineering limitation in how the rotor collective mechanism works. In any case, we'll have to get more creative than that. Okay... What if we had two rotors at all times except when landing? P-factor on demand. Bingo. Enter the feathering aft rotor. Conveniently, our rotors are only driven from the jets on their tips, so killing rotation on the rotors doesn't have to involve a clutch or anything. All we have to do is point the jets straight back and let the rotor windmill as if it was in forward flight. This is easy to do in a flyout. We just add a second input that forces the rear rotor into the feathered position. Now we have tons of P-factor. Now don't get me wrong, at a whopping 22 metric tons, all the P-factor in the world isn't enough to make this monstrosity easy to fly on descent. But with a little practice, it is workable. Like before, the key is to keep your rotor RPM up. I find that a throttle setting of roughly 50% works nicely for the descent phase. Advance it a little as you get close to the ground. Ground effect should help out. But whatever you do, don't go back into a climb. If you absolutely must go back into a climb, immediately defeather your aft blade 
but the P-Factor that was just helping you land will instantly kill you instead. So there you have it. The operating principles of the Convair CV-8675. Is it safe? Hell no. Does it work? Technically. I guess the alternate history Convair is run by Cave Johnson. Alright. Having discussed the design and critical parts of operation, let's talk a little bit about the uh, airplane itself. I mentioned earlier that the Darner was designed as a deliberately silly entry for the regional airliner build prompt, but I'm glad to say I've grown rather attached to it. It's kind of adorable. Far flung from the replica design, there's only the faintest hint of fly-by wire here. Just a touch of turn right auto trim, and it really doesn't need it. And I know you probably can't tell from the video, but I cannot exaggerate how easy and pleasant this is to fly. During takeoff and cruise, anyway. It just seems so eager to please, like it's got no idea how cursed and utterly pointless it is. Like it lives in the bizarre fantasy future depicted in modern mechanics magazine covers. I strongly suggest you snag a download and give it a try yourself. It came out much better than I expected. Okay, so say you're an airline and I've just successfully guilt-tripped you into giving this thing a shot at a good life in your fleet, probably narrowly sparing it a one-way trip to the big sad lot in the Arizona desert. So what have you just bought? A slightly more useful airplane than you might think, actually. The 8675 offers seating for 17 passengers, 3,000 kilometers or 1,600 nautical miles of range, a cruise speed of 330 knots, a top speed of 440 knots, and a 10,000 foot per minute climb and horizontal flight, as well as a roughly 40,000 foot ceiling. And all of this you get for just a helipad worth of takeoff and landing area. At least as long as you're inhumanly accurate. Not bad. Just try not to think about how much you're spending on six engines worth of jet A. Naturally, this aircraft was designed to meet the regional airliner challenge specification. 16 packs, each with 30 kilograms of luggage and a range of 2200 kilometers. Originally, I wasn't looking to pass that mark by much, just to build an aircraft in this quote-unquote hybrid rotor, as I've been calling it, configuration that technically meets the requirements. But that isn't quite how things went. As you might guess, aircraft like this have some very interesting drag characteristics and crews, and the blades I originally built this aircraft with washed in rather than out, as the wings in this version do. That isn't for any particular reason other than that certain depictions of the tree flugel appear to wash in while others wash out. Operating with wash-in made the feather angle difficult to get right. In the original version, the rotor would actually windmill backwards in cruise, which looked awesome, but created an awkward airspeed range where the rotor RPM was very low and the lift a tad uneven. At first, I had all kinds of cool ideas about how I was going to make that into a, a feature rather than a bug, and I was going to have a uh, arc on the airspeed indicator that indicated this area of uneven lift, but there really was no contest. Worse than the rotation reversal problem, the overall drag characteristics of the wash-in design left a lot to be desired. Probably because each blade had a slight negative AOA rather than a slight positive AOA when feathered. I did all my jet tuning to this inferior version and spent a great deal of time chasing what I thought was bad jet design. To date, I don't really know how good these turbines are. All I know about jets is that you can sometimes get away with the explanation suck, squeeze, bang, blow on test questions in college. Mostly, I just moved settings around until the resulting numbers were as good as I could get them, and it wasn't until I was already making the required 2200 kilometers of range that I realized that my drag situation was as bad as it was. A quick swap to wash out, and my rotor reversal was gone, and my range improved by 50%. So we've actually got some pretty healthy range, and a decent payload margin, and both of those without leaving all that much speed on the table. So what about passenger comfort? Oh boy do we have a surprise for them. The 8675 is designed with a unique upper body fitness regiment built directly into the inflating process. Tail sitter designs like this offer some unique boarding challenges. So ostensibly, what one would do here is this. Rotate both rotors to expose the dorsal area of the aircraft and connect a very tall air stair or jetway to the door just above the forward rotor. Passengers and crew, having warmed up for their workout with the super tall air stair, would then board by stepping onto the rear wall of the cabin and approaching the center aisle, which doubles as a ladder. They would then climb up to their desired seat, manage to haul themselves into it, and finally lie back pleasantly tired and ready to sleep the flight away. Provided they survive the necessary acrobatics, anyway. Don't get me wrong, there are better solutions here. The aisle could double as a loading elevator track, and ideally the seats would rotate to spare you the crazy gymnastics. Space is at a premium here, though, and so is my patience for abusing the cross-section editor to make props. 
and really the best solution is to just not use a tail sitter for your regional airliner. But too late! I guess you already bought one. Joke's on you. You're probably taking it somewhere exotic though, since not needing big runways is pretty much the whole point, so maybe find a way to market the whole thing as some kind of quote-unquote adventure package or something. In any case, I hope the 8675 Darner brings the airlines a flyout good fortune, their passengers safe travel, and their pilots plenty of fun. The 8675 is available for download on the Flyout Discord under both the Build Challenge thread and my personal aircraft sharing thread, and at the link in the description. I will probably yet release the replica and a few of the other hybrid rotor configuration aircraft I've built, but single rotor designs are a huge challenge to get to fly easily and reliably enough to not require too much luck, overly perfect flying, or overly perfect weather. Hopefully I can get them out soon. Next video should be a build video for the Prakasa 01 Ornithopter, as I'm already mostly done with that. I probably would be if I hadn't gotten distracted with this project, but you know how that goes. Anyway, thanks for watching.